So my big thanks to the organizers for, you know, plowing through with this meeting and for inviting me and giving me the chance to talk about uh, one of my current favorite topics, um, which I think fits in very, very well with the gravity experiment topic. So uh, it may be a big departure from some of the things I'm known for, but I hope that everyone will get something out of, out of today's talk. So aside from that, uh, in the introduction, as was mentioned, I'm supported by the NRF and the DST, and I just want to thank and acknowledge them and the University of Cape Town for continued support. Um, yeah, without further ado, let me launch into what I want to say. So in my career, I've sort of had a set of problems that I'm interested in, and they've evolved slightly with time, but actually to a large extent, many of them are the same things I've worried about since I was a grad student or even in my undergrad days. And I think it's worth sort of laying them out as a framework for why I've taken this big step towards astrophysics. So the first is very early universe questions. They break up into sort of classes, right? The very early universe, the late universe, and things that are sort of time independent. The very early universe questions involve quantum gravity, how the universe began and how we live in what appears to be very much a classical gravity universe. But at some point there would have had to be some quantum phase and how did we make that transition? In terms of the late universe, we, this is where we have lots of big open problems as well, less philosophical than the early universe one. So the nature of dark matter and dark energy. And of course, the role that beyond the standard model physics can play in cosmology, which is still very much an open question, I think, even though uh, perhaps less discussed right now. In terms of the timeless questions, these perhaps pertain very much to some of this meeting, which is, are we working on the right theory of gravity? Um, and how would we know if we'd gone wrong? Are we looking for the right parameters for cosmology? Have we gone wrong there as well? And why do we appear to live in such a special place? in such a special set of dimensions, et cetera. And this has sort of led me to looking at some of the puzzles that are longstanding and some that are, that are newer in astrophysics because really astrophysics is the gravity playground. It's the experimental you know, play space of gravity and fundamental physics is really built on and having a better understanding of gravity. And so the linkage is very clear. In terms of cosmology, which I think for a long time I thought was the, the definite way to go, um, we've made phenomenal progress, right? I have, you know, the list of, of parameters that we're trying to work out and get constraints on. You can see the, the errors, the error bars on them are just getting smaller. We're moving more and more towards precision. It's not clear that, we're, that they're accurate, but they're certainly precise. And you can see this either through looking at the, the table of figures, or you can look at the dramatic improvement of the CMB data from Kobe uh, sort of 30 years ago now, wow, that's remarkable, to WMAP 20 years ago and Planck basically a decade ago, that level of precision has just increased. Um, but if you look at where we're getting our data from and what we understand from our universe, it's coming from the very recent universe. So if you, you look at the image on the, on the left corner, uh, you can see that it's coming from the very recent universe. So the galaxies, relatively near to us and the CMB relatively far. And there's this kind of gap in between uh, that is far less explored. And so that's sort of something to bear in mind where our cosmology information is coming from. So putting this together, I think, yeah, putting this together, we, we, we appear to have a universe that is very well understood. But the reality is that within all those little error bars and measurements, there's a whole lot of big open questions. So dark energy and dark matter and inflation, I think are the very well known ones. If you've worked in cosmology or talked to cosmology people, it's very clear that these are sort of three big problems that are not getting better, right? Um, and then there's sort of ones that seem a bit smaller. So the missing baryon problem, which I'll come back to a bit later, so I won't explain here, how galaxies form. And then, you know, these sort of tensions in the data. So the H naught crisis is something that's being talked about a lot. And, and I use it just as an exemplar for a direction to go. So, um, you know, if you know, you know about the Hubble constant, I think some in the audience probably taught me about the Hubble constant many years ago. And I remember you know, in the late nineties, learning that it was either, uh, you know, that there was one school of thought that had it as basically about 80 
and another about 50, but it didn't really matter because the error bars were so large that they fit within each other. But you can see that over time, those error bars have gotten smaller and the central value is going further apart instead of closer together. Well, it's closer together, but the error bars are smaller, so they don't include each other. And every bit of new data seems to make things worse as opposed to better. So we went from, you know, Einstein thinking about uh, GR and how it would apply to the universe, the field of cosmology as really being a philosophy, an area of philosophy, to what we thought in the last few years was an era of precision. And now we seem to have hit what is clearly an era of crisis. So just to highlight the H naught one, there's no point looking at the details, but the, you can see the incredible amount of work that people have put in to like figure out what's exactly going on. You can see the very early measures and the very late measures give you vastly different results, right? So the Cepheids are building up uh, chains of distance measures using Cepheids that are relatively near to us. And Planck is using the CMB that's relatively far from us. So remember what I said, our data comes from nearby or very far, and those two don't quite match. So it's possible that there's something else going on. There's a bunch of, of open questions there, but it tells you that we're at least in an era where we have to be more careful or completely change the way we do things. So what are the different approaches we could take? I think these apply very well for dark energy, dark matter, the Hubble tension, but really they're, they're good solutions, I think, for any cosmological crisis like this. So the, the first one is perhaps the most obvious one, which is to relook at the data, right? Is, is, has the analysis gone wrong? Is the methodology wrong? This is not something I'm doing at all. Um, the next is to look for new physics, right? Is there something that we're missing? Is there some other physical particle, something, a dark energy particle, dark matter particle, something beyond the standard model that we're missing? Is there perhaps some evolving field that would explain the dramatic change in what appears to be the Hubble constant from the very early universe to the very late universe? So that is one approach. Another is to say, well, setting aside what we know, are there different ways, novel ways to probe these big open problems and these unusual tensions? Can we do lab experiments, for example? Are there direct or indirect ways to test these questions? Can we look to astrophysics as a different playground? And you know, where further can we go in the cosmic frontier? The, the, the bravest is perhaps to come up with a new theory and say, well, the theory of gravity that we have is actually just wrong and we need to fix it. And you know, Einstein's GR has hit its limit just like Newtonian gravity did. But if you take that approach, you still have to go back around the circle because you need to test your new theory against all known observations, make new predictions, and then use new observations to rule out your theory or place new constraints. So this is sort of the map of how I see things um, given the big problems that we have. And it brings me to, to the astrophysics opportunity, which is the target of my talk today, which is basically fast radio bursts. So these objects, they, did, they, they were not known about, you know, when I was doing my PhD, they were discovered basically only afterwards. And they're transients, which uh, I think this community will know what the word means, but it's essentially an astrophysical object that's in the sky for a relatively brief time. Um, and so you, these are extremely brief, they're millisecond or microsecond timescales, but uh, transients are sort of broader than that. They were only discovered uh, very recently and um, the, in the beginning, it was thought that they were, that it was an anomaly, that it was just an anomaly in the data. And then I think the second one, it was believed to be, um, the second one went away, the data went away because they realized it was actually always observed at lunchtime. And the fact that it was always seen at lunchtime in the data just seemed far too coincidental. And they realized in the end, it was the microwave from the lab. And so, you know, in the beginning, it wasn't certain that even that first burst was real. And it was only after looking in archival data, so looking in existing data, that they found many, many more. And uh, when I started working in the area, there were like 20 that had been observed, maybe 30. And now we're at a, at a situation where there are hundreds. Hundreds have been observed. And over the coming decade, we should be seeing tens of thousands. So it's, an, it's a rapidly growing field with a huge amount that we can learn. We don't fully understand what drives them. I'll explain more about what they are in a moment, but I'll just say we don't totally understand the physics behind them, though there are strong hints that there are magnetar mechanisms that are at least driving some of them. We don't even know how many classes there are. We just know that they're very bright, they're very brief, um, 
and they're at cosmological distances, which I'll explain in a moment as well. So I've put some of my papers, there's some more since then uh, up here, but the first was really just a foray, a bunch of my, of my students really led by Emma Platz, who just finished her PhD, took a look at all the known um, FRB theories. We just thought, you know, there's so many different theories. Let's try to understand FRBs by understanding the different theories. I think there were 48 FRB observations at this point. So people had seen 48 fast radio bursts, but there were like 51 theories. So there were more theories than data. And we thought that was kind of interesting. So we set up this theory wiki, just cataloging everything that was known about each of the theories as a way to sort of structure and organize things. And of course, uh, for us to learn. And we got the help of uh, Sriharsh Tendulkar, who is uh, an established FRB um, astronomer. So there's a bunch of things you can do with them. You can try to do some very sort of physics-y things. Could they be driven by cosmic strings? You know, when cosmic strings collapse on themselves, they make, they produce energy bursts. Can you use them for cosmology, which I'll talk about today? And uh, last year, Anthony Walters, who's at UKZN now, my former PhD student and I, wrote this very nice uh, news and views piece about the very first FRB discovered in our galactic backyard that, that appeared in nature. So what do we really know about them? We know the time scales are short, so millisecond, maybe microsecond uh, pulses. We know their frequency range is relatively large. This is just where they've been observed. So we expect them to go down to, you know, maybe 200 megahertz and possibly much higher than eight gigahertz. But this is where they've been observed so far. Relatively few of them have been localized to hosts. What I mean by that is host galaxies. So you expect them to be within a host galaxy. The, the galaxies are outside of our own. There's only one within our galaxy. So they're at cosmological distances. Um, and they're bright enough that we can see them at cosmological distances, but, but uh, not necessarily very far yet though we expect to be able to. We've only managed to localize a few to hosts because it's just extremely hard to do. Uh, looking along the line of sight, you need something else that helps you. There can be multiple galaxies along the line of sight and it can be very hard to localize them unless you have very good uh, localization accuracy sort of information. One way to do it is if there's some kind of optical counterpart. So you get your optical and your radio telescopes to talk to each other. We've only seen a tiny uh, fraction of the parameter space. Not surprisingly, the telescope's only looking at small parts of the sky. And we're only looking at purpose-built telescopes now. To a large extent, we've been using um, data that was already, already archived, so like data that's already stored. And if the time resolution is not uh, archived, if the time resolution is not good enough or the data is not archived, then we can't access it. So it's really important to have that high time resolution data, like shutter speed on a camera. You know, if the shutter speed is too low, then you, you miss images. They would look like blurred out images as opposed to a tiny peak. So some of them appear to repeat. And some of those repetitions appear to have some kind of periodic pattern, though it's still not fully understood. Um, what we do know about them is that they trace their environments incredibly well. So we can learn about the intergalactic medium, about the stuff between us and them by studying fast radio bursts. That's the point at which I realized they can be tools for cosmology. We don't know about their polarization because some come, appear to be linear, some circular, and it's not clear if it's intrinsic or the extent to which it, uh, the polarization has changed from uh, effects between the, the source and us. We, we, the biggest uncertainties we have is in the, is in the fact that we need to separate the effect of the host galaxy and the intergalactic medium. And so understanding the dispersion measure is everything right now. And it's very difficult to do because we need to separate those things. We don't know how far they go in redshift. It's not clear what explains them, or even if there's one mechanism, there may be like, um, you know, other astrophysical objects, gamma ray bursts, et cetera, that have multiple uh, types. And so it may be that our catalogs become catalogs of catalogs. So that's sort of what we know. So how do we really learn about them? What is the probe available to us? The best probe is something called the dispersion measure, which essentially is the fact that you have this pulse of light and it's traveling through, uh, through the intergalactic medium to us through a plasma, a cold plasma of electrons. So you can imagine that depending on the frequency of the light, it's gonna be slowed down by those electrons at a rate of one over uh, the frequency squared. It's fairly typical dispersion 
And so when you receive the, the, uh, the pulse, you can infer backwards the distance if you know enough about the number of electrons between us and the object. So we can get some sense of how far away the object is by looking at the dispersion measure. The fact that the dispersion measure is large, we realize they must be extragalactic. They can't be local. And so far, they all do appear to have host galaxies. So that, which is what you would expect if they are involved in anything to do with structure formation or matter formation or cosmic strings, et cetera. All of that requires them to have host galaxies. They can't be sort of renegades on their own. So with Tony Walters and uh, Brian Gainsler, who's a proper radio astronomer, who is the person who actually introduced me to the field, um, and Dienja Ma, who's also at UKZN, and my former PhD student, uh, Amadeus Witzemann, we took a look at what can you do cosmologically with these objects? So can we, the first question we had was, can you do better for curvature, for example? You know, um, we talk all the time about uh, the universe being flat, but actually all of our curvature constraints are relative to dark energy constraints. And so it's an assumption that we sort of are inserting at this point. If you look at the Planck data, it's actually just inserted omega k is zero to some extent. So if we want to do a really good job, would these guys be better tools for us? Sort of a priori, you would think oh, it's not so easy because we're not seeing them far enough away. But this was before we, we were starting to build uh, telescope arrays and we thought let's see how just let's just see how well we can do so you so why would you think that cosmology is involved well your dispersion your dispersion measure involves that number of electrons essentially this equation that I have here is now called the Macart relation it wasn't uh, when I started working in the field <clears throat> it is now and essentially it tells you the relationship from redshift to dispersion and so um what you have in there is all your cosmological information. And if you have matter, if you have dark energy, if you have curvature, you can get constraints in some sense on any one of them by using prior cosmology constraints and allowing the FRBs to constrain a new one. So this is a mix of astrophysics information and cosmology information. And you need to insert what prior you have for dark energy. So you're not fully break, you're not breaking the, that degeneracy that has to be done in a different way but subject to some prior, can you do better for curvature? So the, the difficulty of course, is that the dispersion measures is everything. It's the Milky Way contribution, which we sort of understand well from galactic pulsars. It's the cosmological contribution, which is all we care about. And it's the host galaxy contribution, which we have no clue about. So your options are either try to find bursts that are at the edge of their galaxies, in which case we need enough of them that we can then just choose you know, our, our favorite ones, or they need, there needs to be some physics reason why the edges are favored over the centers. So that's one option. The other option is to get bursts that are very, very far away, because the further away the burst is, the larger the contribution of DM, IGM, and the smaller the relative contribution of the host galaxy. So you can sort of underweight that contribution if you can get them from far enough away. So we looked at some kind of, um, we, we simulated some kind of Hyrax-like survey. I'll talk about Hyrax a bit later, but it's any sort of intensity mapping type of experiment survey. And um, we simulated a thousand FRBs, which seemed like a lot at the time. And I sort of thought it was interesting because as a theorist, I thought a thousand was quite small. Let's use 10,000. Gainsler, who's a proper radio astronomer was like, you know, are you mad? We have we've only seen 50, a thousand is phenomenal. Uh, let's, you know, even if we use a thousand, we're overestimating how many we'll see. And so we just had this really, it was really sort of interesting to see this different uh, set of approaches. Of course, now we've almost seen a thousand and we'll see tens of thousands soon. But a thousand was enough for us to see what you need to do to get constraints. So not surprisingly, you can only really constrain Omega Baryon because it's the number of electrons that are playing a role here. It's the fact that you're moving through electrons. If you allow for a non-flat uh, lambda CDM, then you get very nice orthogonal constraints between your FRBs and your cosmology priors. So CBSH is, is all of them. It's the CMB, it's the baryons, it's the H0, et cetera. So um, that we sort of thought was very interesting, but of course you're very much limited by your uncertainties, which is key to really remember. Everything I talk about has one limitation, I think at least. So in working on this, Tony actually realized that we were assuming 
an FIGM. So we looked up FIGM, which is the fraction uh, in the, of uh, baryons in the intergalactic medium. And we were using that number as a prior, but actually the, that number is not really that well known. We had just looked up the number that people use, but it assumes that you understand that you've solved the missing baryon problem, which had not been done. So the missing baryon problem is this is this sort of uh, uh, long-standing problem of the fact that we know about sort of five percent of the universe is baryons, but when we add up all of the ones that we see, we only see seventy percent of that five percent. So about thirty percent of them are just completely missing. They're expected to be in the warm hot intergalactic medium, but they're not observed. They're not accounted for, and so we you know, Tony had this very clever idea of like, well, let's turn things around. Let's take cosmology as a prior and see if we can get a constraint on FIGM and whether that constraint would solve the missing baryon problem. And so that's what we did in this paper uh, with John Sievers as well. And given precision cosmology, you can now constrain FIGM. And if you get the right value, you would solve the missing baryon problem. So we published this in 2019. And in early 2020, there was this nature paper by McCart and others showing, doing exactly that. So we went from, you know, a theory paper in one year that I think probably was not a surprise to the community, but of course to us was this fascinating thing to them actually solving the problem immediately the, the year after. And if you've worked in gravity for long or you've worked in cosmology, the timescales are huge, right? Theoretical physics timescales are huge. So it's really exciting to be in a field where the timescales are so small. People are working out very, very quickly uh, what's going on. So just to sort of understand what they did, you've got your burst coming out of a galaxy here and it's moving towards the observer who's in a different galaxy, the earth, and the different frequency components are moving through the electrons on the bottom. On the top one, imagine that you're in vacuum. So of course the different components move faster and are slowed down at differential rates by moving through um, the intergalactic medium through those electrons. And so you can get constraints just from that. So that, that's exactly what they did. And what they needed, what was very, very important, what they needed was localized bursts. You needed really accurate distance information. And they took four bursts that had been localized. When I started working in the field, there was only one that had been localized. And since then, there's been a whole host. Now we're in the 20s. There were four bursts that were localized. The redshifts, you can see they're cosmological, but they're still quite small. And all these objects are near the edges of their host galaxies. So that makes them very good to use because you don't, the host galaxy is not contributing much noise. But it also tells you that maybe something is going on. Is there a reason that the FRBs seem to be at the edge of their host galaxies or is it a selection bias? So it leads you to ask new questions, of course. They all seem to be galaxies uh, similar to ours they're still star forming. So they're in that, that stage of life. And it gives you these hints about progenitors, right? Things that are expected to be evenly spread across the galaxy become less likely. Um, and it seemed to be a good, a good pointing towards neutron stars or magnetars as sort of progenitor mechanisms. So the key there was localization. And so it's worth sort of pointing out that the, way, the ways to get localization, you can use counterparts. So if you see an X-ray observation, like the way we localized the one within our galaxy last year is there were, it was, I think, seven countries and seven experiments and multiple countries seeing X-ray observations, um, gamma ray observations and radio observations coming from the same source and from different parts of the sky. So uh, in the US, sorry, in Canada, the US and um, China. So different parts of the sky and seeing these different uh, these these the, the same burst from different uh, angles and different um, parts of the spectrum. And so that allowed for localizing. But another option is if you have something called outriggers. So if you imagine an array of telescopes or even a single dish, your, your accuracy, your localization ability is limited by the size of the dish. If you send some dishes very, very far away, you, you actually act as if you have a dish that big. So by putting out riggers, these little sets of dishes very far from the main array of dishes, you can get an experiment that is effectively the size of Africa for us, for Hyrax, um, and Chime can do something similar. So you get really phenomenal localization. 
So instead of being able to say, well, somewhere in this arc minute, which is, you know, roughly this galaxy, maybe this part of the sky where this galaxy is within, there's an FRB. Instead of that, you can now zoom into the galaxy and say it's right here in this galaxy. You can get sub arc second resolution. And Chime recently published a, um, they recently published a catalog of new FRBs seen. And that gorgeous image on the left-hand side, that's half the sky. It's just what happens when you project uh, things from a sphere onto, a, you know, onto a flat uh, page. That half of the sky is what Chime sees. And that's where the bursts, you know, are all sitting. And you can see that the localization is extremely good. They have 50 milli arc second resolution. So it's not quite sub arc second resolution, but it's very good. And it should allow us to really understand a lot more. So the key to really doing good science is to being able to identify the bursts, classify them and localize them. So in terms of my wish list, um, I don't think I need to explain the dark matter problem uh, to this audience. And I, I think I'm running a low on time. So I will just point out the fact that dark matter, uh, you know, as much as it's an astrophysics problem, we have no good theory for it. And the many of these images, all of them are incomplete. So this one is as incomplete as any others. But despite having no good theory for them, we also have no direct detection for them. So they really are sort of a, a field that we know, we're pretty sure that they're there astrophysically, but we are not making progress in observing them. And it's possible that FRBs bring a huge opportunity for dark matter. Why? Well, first of all, there, there are sources of light, right? So we would be able to see the effect of various types of dark matter through lensing of FRBs. Uh, one particular example is machos, so these massive compact halos. If they were large mass, uh, <clears throat> large uh, mass uh, uh, black holes, they could possibly explain some subsection of dark matter. And they sort of went out of vogue, I think some time ago, because um, they weren't expected to exist, but the unexpected results of LIGO Virgo are that actually there's a much bigger range of, of uh, black hole masses. And it may be that there are these primordial black holes that could now actually explain some of dark matter. But if you have these objects out in the sky, then FRBs would be lensed around them. And you would either get a double peaked FRB if, uh, if you have machos and then there's this micro lensing, or if you have strong lensing, you would get repeated FRBs. Uh, you would get repeated observations of the same FRB with a time delay. And so there are ways that we can actually do this. There are already constraints that have come out and there's a lot more that we should be able to do um, in future with Meerkat and with Hyrax. So the current constraint comes from ASCAP by looking at the substructure of the bursts some large number of FRBs would allow us to get better constraints um, than we already have. So that's quite, that's quite a big deal. And the progress in future is expected to be huge. We just need to see more bursts and they, they need to be further out. It's better if they're shorter lived and we eventually will have to automate the process because we're gonna go from having sort of 20 bursts to study to tens of thousands. Dark energy is no different. I've already explained to you the stuff that we've looked at for curvature and dark energy you saw was in those cosmology equations. Again, I won't explain the dark energy problem. I assume this audience is probably quite familiar with the fact that the universe appears to be accelerating in its expansion and we have no good argument for why and really a dearth of um, new ways to test that acceleration. So again, FRBs give you this opportunity. If you can get enough of the bursts, far enough out, so above redshift of three, then we can ignore the host contribution because it's gonna be relatively small. We can ignore recent uh, history and we can get constraints on the equation of state of dark energy. So that's quite a big deal. Um, similarly, if you can associate them with GRBs, then you get, a, uh, you get a, a counterpart that will allow you to get a very good um, dispersion measure for the FRB and a very good redshift from the GRB and again, you can constrain that dark energy equation of state. You can think back to the equation I showed you in the beginning, the McCart relation. You just need to pin down a few of the variables. And there are lots of different ways to do it. You could use FRBs to break distance degeneracies in the CMB as well, and possibly get better constraints on H0. There are a couple of papers that are already trying to do this. So the field is moving very, very fast. And nobody was thinking about cosmology until a few years ago. And now it's extremely... Um, it's an extremely popular direction to go. So I think there's a wealth of new stuff that can happen. 
And the future, I think, um, will involve uh, cross correlation. So having a map of the FRBs and cross correlating with other cosmology information is going to take us very, very far. And I think we're getting there very soon. Seeing a lot of high redshift FRBs would also be amazing because then we can rule out uh, low redshift stuff, but that's hard to do because it's no surprise we see the low redshift ones, you know, selection bias again, bright things nearby are easier to see than bright things very far away. So there's also fundamental physics opportunities. Um, you remember that one over nu squared behavior. Well, if the photon has a rest mass, you would see that same behavior. There's a one over nu squared. In terms of the dispersion measure, there's a there's a contribution to the to the uh, group velocity basically of the wave that looks like a one over nu squared. So so we can constrain. In fact, I think the best constraints on the mass of the photon currently come from an FRB, um, basically because. Uh, those are not seen from looking at different FRBs. Those, that, that relation is not observed. And so we can get really good constraints on the mass of the photon. Similarly, if, the, if there's a violation of the weak equivalence principle, then you would see a time delay in the different frequency components and we can get really good constraints on um, that as well. And so these are just two examples. You can also constrain non-Gaussianity is a vast amount of, of early universe or fundamental physics questions that can be answered by having enough FRBs or very much information about few of them. You can overcome um, the, you can overcome one set of statistical problems with a solution of the other form. And so I think there's really a lot that can be done. Uh, I've included this image and I'll explain a little bit briefly some work uh, sort of led again by Emma Platts. And this is with the Meertrap collaboration from uh, Meerkat. And so this is Meerkat data. This is the most well-studied FRB to date, 12.11.02. And what I've got here is the different bursts. And the reason that I'm showing this to you is so that you can see how different their shapes are. So it's not simple. It's not so clear necessarily when you have a burst. And to some extent, you need to be far more clever to understand what's going on if you want to start to study lots of them. So originally it was believed that all of them looked like number two, but it was very, very clear there, burst two, that there's just, you know, this big burst and then nothing. And as you go, you look at three and you're like, well, is that a subburst on the left? And if you wanted to understand something to do with dark matter, perhaps you need to start to understand that substructure. And so understanding the substructure of bursts has become a very important problem. And we studied 11, um, well, we studied all of them, but on this slide, I'm showing you 11. So that's the last one. And you can see a whole lot of very interesting stuff that you can learn out of just trying to understand um, that one sub, that one burst within this repeating FRB. And even just trying to understand how to pin down the dispersion measure. So what is the exact uh, location of that burst? It depends on, on the methodology you use. So do you optimize over the whole structure and look for a single peak? Do you, do you just look for what is the highest signal to noise part of the peak? So then you're focused on the bit on the left. You know, how do you read the fact that you have the sad trombone effect? So if you look at, you look at the sort of downward drift in frequency, that's called the sad trombone. So the wah, wah, wah sound is extremely common in FRBs. There's almost no FRB that has upward drift. And when they do, it's sort of understood what the artifact is that is causing it. So the physics of what's driving that, what we can learn from the environment. There's this huge amount of stuff that can come out of a relatively small package of data. Um, and I think the future is very much going to involve uh, some relatively simple machine learning algorithms. Actually, I don't think it's, they're required to be sophisticated, but um, we expect to see sort of thousands, tens of thousands of these. And so there's no more working on them by hand. And we need to be able to remove the RFI. I've got up there the beautiful range that Hyrax is working at. So that's the 400 to 800 range. You can see it's where the RFI is, is uh, minimum, is minimized. Um, but where there's low signal to noise, so where you're just seeing an FRB over that background, you need to come up with algorithms to remove the RFI. We need to figure out ways to identify them. And the further away faint ones are going to be more interesting. So there's a whole lot of, you know, I, 
I may be saying quite a lot today, but there's a whole lot of exciting new science to come that is both physics and machine learning and astrophysics and this engineering components and this cosmology. There's that full range of interesting, interesting approaches to using FRBs as tools to understand the universe. So regardless of sort of your interests, there's a lot um, that I think will come. Um, so in terms of South Africa, I think we're gonna play a really, really important role in this field uh, very, very like immediately, very soon. So already there's, there's Meerkat that's discovering bursts and we're doing you know great science with Meerkat. But the hydrogen intensity and real-time analysis experiment, I think will be game changing. So it's very much like Chime, that experiment that I showed you the data from, but the design is different and it's in the Southern hemisphere. So we don't have to worry about snow. And that means that the dish shape is different. So our dishes are parabolic. The chime dishes are cylindrical because they have to worry about snow uh, warping the dish shape. So the, the project is, uh, you can see it's an international collaboration, but it's really championed out of UKZN. So I think the people who are there who are anywhere organizing will know very much about this, but it's worth sort of highlighting for everyone the amount of science that can come. I've focused on the FRB science, but that chunk of the universe that I was saying that we, is not well probed will be well probed by uh, Hyrax. I'll show you a slide in a moment about that. But essentially, there's not just FRBs, there's also baryon acoustic oscillation. So there's proper cosmology that Hyrax will be doing. And you can see here the cosmological constraints. The one on the left is one that Amadeus uh, made for a paper that we were working on. And uh, Devon has made far better. Devon Crichton on the right hand side has made far better forecasts. But you can see that you get novel and better forecasts orthogonal to existing data and that they should do better than um, Planck in various parts of the parameter space. So the dish is currently under construction. The name Hyrax does not come from the rock band. It comes like all astronomy uh, names for things. It comes from being far too cute. So the CAT7 is the Karoo Array telescopes. There's seven of them in the Karoo. To make more of them is meerkat, so more of the cats, but that's of course the meerkat, the animals that live uh, in the Karoo, and then very close to those animals in the Karoo are rock dussies, also known as hyraxes, and hence the name, uh, my slide seems to have frozen. Someone else had this problem, and hence the name hyrax. Sorry, I don't know why the slide has frozen. I will just manually go to the next one. Okay, so, the, the, the importance of um, the government cannot actually be underestimated. In 2007, they committed this Astronomy Geographic Advantage Act uh, to policy, and that means that the whole Karoo or this large section of the Karoo is kept radio quiet. And so that 400 to 800 megahertz range is really optimum, both for dark energy. You can see on the bottom left, that's the range where we would get uh, redshift of about one to two and a half, which is ideal to learn about the switching on of dark energy and at some sub part of the FRB observation range. So Hyrax is both an FRB machine and a cosmology machine, and it will be spread around the continent, we hope, but certainly uh, it will start, the primary sites will be sharing uh, the SKA site, so sharing resources, which is great. And hopefully we will be building outriggers in different African countries and building this phenomenal experiment. So what I was saying before about probing the full volume of the universe, you can see that the very early universe is probed with CMB, the very late universe is probed with galaxies, and that middle chunk, which actually may have more information to tell us, is relatively unprobed. And so looking at these absorption lines, the 21 centimeter in our case, but there are other lines, allows you to probe everything in between. So that 21 centimeter line should get you to realization, but then there's other lines that people are looking at. And so Hyrax actually has the potential to do both. And so we can learn about the full uh, cosmic volume. It's not the purpose of this talk, but I cannot give a talk um, on, on the one without sort of mentioning the other. So sort of as a summary on the uh, FRB side, there's just a huge amount you can do. And we've done these various sort of approaches to how to understand and how to contribute to this growing, beautiful area of precision science. If I were to write my wish list, it would be that we can get dark matter, dark energy, 
and curvature information out. There's work already happening on uh, the epoch of reionization. There's fundamental physics questions that we're answering. We still can answer a lot about FRBs, how they form and their environments. Some problems are already solved. And really the, the sort of takeaway is that I, I've stolen this quote from Dirac. The original quote is, if you're receptive and humble, mathematics will lead you by the hand. But I think in the case of, of astronomy, actually the data will lead you by the hand. And so um, as my final slide, instead of conclusions, I will give you lessons from FRBs, which is that um, many of these, the, the key lesson is many of them were discovered in archival data. So we did not make new discoveries because of some technological innovation. We just changed the way we looked at our existing data. And I think sometimes that's really key. You know, people always see a problem and think you need to add things, but sometimes you just need to look at the problem in a different way or possibly take away things. You know, you remove one Lego piece and suddenly you have a flat roof, but uh, most people will just add 30 Lego pieces to make a flat roof. So uh, sometimes you need to just look at your problem differently. And so the great discovery of FRBs just came from looking at the data with a different lens. And of course, to see many more, we, we need technological innovations, but we never would have even been on this path had we not been willing to change our sort of outlook. The next point is that the first one you find, even the first few are not at all representative of what's out there. Um, and again, you know, that's typical. You see a couple of, of uh, you know, white horses as you're walking along a field and you assume that all horses are white. But of course, it's not the case, right? You're very, very biased by what you see. And so everybody thought that FRBs were just like the first one that was well studied, but actually they've turned out, as we see more, they're all, there's so much more information coming in that we do not have um, a good handle at all on, on what's going on with FRBs. If you have limited resources or limited data, you, there's worse bias because you follow up over and over on the things that you know, the things you're comfortable with. And so again, I think there's a good lesson to take into other areas, which is to try and suppress the bias that comes about from having limited data. And if you don't see anything, you have to keep searching. I think the gravitational wave people in the audience will absolutely agree with that without doubt. And the importance of looking at all messengers, all wavelengths, all parts of the sky for data to consider the whole universe in all of its sort of elements for us to possibly really understand what's going along. And if we can't set aside our biases, we will always find what we're searching for. And finally, the last takeaway is if you really want to worry about 5G, then you should worry about the RFI it contributes because that wrecks um, our good science. So hopefully I've managed to convince some of you that FRBs offer us a great potential for discovery. There are new puzzles out there there's, and new ideas is the way to solve them and possibly solve some of our very, very old long-standing problems as well. And so it's really worth jumping feet first into totally new fields um, to learn something new about old problems that we've maybe been working on our whole careers. And that's it.